talk about David Dunson, Bruce Willis, you know, Bruce Willis is a guy, you know, he, he, he phones in a lot of performances, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. But when he finds the right role, I think it really fits him. I think this is the right role for him. Just kind of like a worn down guy who's just going through life. And, uh, and I think it was a very bold move to, to have the, the quote unquote hero, I guess, well, he is the hero of this story. Like the opening scene, we have him, you know, take off his wedding ring and try to hit on somebody mm-hmm. on a train. Like this showed mm-hmm. you, this isn't, this is really isn't the best guy, right? He's not <laughs> your Dudley Do Right Superman type, right? He's just a just a normal guy, does some shady stuff, trying to hit on somebody on a train. You're like, oh man, that's and and the scene is played appropriately awkward as well by by all involved. So yeah, and that sets the whole tone for who this guy is uh, to a certain degree. And he kind of not that he has to have like a redemption arc from that, but he goes from being that kind of guy to the guy who's going to go seek out crimes and stop them. So that mm-hmm. that is his hero's journey, and then you know rekindling the relationship with his wife, and then also his son, you know. So there's mm-hmm. some good human stuff in here, and that's why it's cool to take this everyman, you know, blue collar worker like David Dunn is, you know, security guard at a, at a college stadium, and turn or like Tom Cruise in War of the Worlds. That <laughs> that is that's. <laughs> Okay, and uh, see now that scene, I think it it, 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 I don't know, it kind of alleviates some of the pain on a rewatch because, you know, you know the trouble that he's going through. Like, like he's on his way out of that marriage when he's on that train, mm-hmm. right? And like upon a rewatch, you see it where yeah, they end up together at the end, but he's on his way out and he's holding on, and it feels like his wife is not holding on, mm. and so he's like, you know what? maybe I don't have to hold on anymore. So like the first time you see it, it has one layer and then seeing it again, it has a different layer. Well, and then he immediately puts the wedding ring back on when that, you know, when that woman's like, I'm going to go find a different seat. Right. And you're right. But let's talk about that scene with, uh, with him and her when she's like, have you, I'm going to ask you something and it's not going to affect me no matter what you say. Uh, and she says it Mm -hmm. like three times. She's like, it doesn't matter what your answer is. It's totally cool. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. <laughs> like she goes way out of or out of her way to say it's totally cool. Tell me whatever. It's like, have you been with anyone else since we've been having problems? He's like, no, I haven't. And then she like breaks down. She's like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So clearly, she has been the one who has been unfaithful during this this period, this rocky period of the relationship, which I thought was another interesting layer to have. That, that's what I took I, from that. <laughs> I didn't take that from that scene. What did you I take from that, that from, scene? I just took it from the scene where um, she was saying she wanted to know. And those were tears of joy because mm. it really was important to her. She was telling him it wasn't important, but it really was important because she wanted him to tell the truth. Mm-hmm. Right? So I didn't take it that she had been cheating on him. Uh, maybe it's because of the deleted scene where it's like one of her friends mistakes this guy for a different guy. That kind of colored yeah. my opinion of it. But you're right. Yeah. It, contextually in the movie, uh, I can see you, you can read it a lot of ways, but I like that. Uh, mm-hmm. So I don't. That's even, how I read it. <laughs> even in the deleted scene, she didn't necessarily cheat. Okay, right, right. Because that could have just been somebody she met and became infatuated with, and was talking to her coworker friend about him. Mm-hmm. Oh, I really like this guy. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Right. So I I don't get the impression that the wife cheated. Okay. In, uh, in this movie, I, yeah. I, no, I think I think it is open for interpretation. Uh, no, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's. Having this guy like because like you said he's on the way out he, he when he when he gets home we find out that he got a, a job offer from New York and he's like I did right. I don't know if I got the job I probably didn't but either way I'm still moving there and then he goes upstairs to stay mm-hmm. in his son's room so you like man this guy's life is like and this is like real life <laughs> like mm-hmm. I, I appreciate the the real life struggles of of the characters in this movie you know because you have yeah. your you have your superhero drama obviously and then you have your real life drama you know. And, mm-hmm. and speaking of drama, what about the scene where, where the kid's going to shoot him? Man, that's an intense scene. Oh, man. Right? Yeah. Um, that scene is very intense. And that kid is very confused because, you know, his dad is like, he thinks his dad's a superhero. And you know what? He probably would kill his dad if he shot him, right? No matter how strong his dad is, that would right. probably kill him. So, yeah, that's a very, very strong, powerful scene. And I like his reaction where... Instead, he just gets mad at his son and is like, "You're grounded," and like, right. or like whatever. Like, I am he your says, father. Like, you're going to listen to me. He's like, "If you if you shoot me, you're right. It's going to bounce right off me." But I'm going to get on that trade. I'm going to go to New York, and I'm never coming back. Right? And like, he yeah. has to he has to kind of use psychology on the kid to make him stop. Right? And I, that was right. a very very intense, very powerful scene. I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I like I like 
the relationship with, with with him and his son here, like especially the the scene where he's lifting weights like in the basement, and he's like, "Wow, how much did you put don't on?" Don't you ever try this. <laughs> This is, don't you ever be this stupid. Like, <laughs> well, then, I like how the, the the son, he keeps getting further away. Like, he's like, I want you to stand back. Like, he's he's standing kind of far away, and then he's in the doorway, and he's, like, up the stairs, <laughs> you know? And then they end up putting, they end up putting like, a, a paint on each side of it just to see how strong he is, and he can, you know, uh, press about 350 pounds. So, uh, Okay, so I wanted to ask you about that scene, too, because it's like, why does it seem like it's hard for him to do this? When he's, they're putting hundreds of pounds extra every time, right? Like, why do these weights seem heavy for him to lift? Well, it's, he's not Superman, right? It's still, it takes exertion, but he can do it. And also, it's it's one of these kind of flight or flight or reflexes you have. Like, obviously, you know, we have the flashback with him and his wife in the car accident, right? From college. Yeah. He rips off the door of the car and gets her out of there, you know? Mm-hmm. And he's not hurt at all. So, when he's in these extreme circumstances and he has to do these things, he can they're not easy, but he can do them. But of mm-hmm. course, as a normal, as someone who thinks he's a normal person, he's not going to put himself in those situations on a regular basis. So I just see that as like somebody finding their limits, you know, cause this is not, again, this is a real world version of comic books. So he's not, he just can't effortlessly lift 500 pounds, but he, if he really tries, he can do it. And that's why he can do it. So he's only invisible when people don't look at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, well, I mean, that's, well, to me, okay, let's talk about this. Um, Do you tw- know what that's a reference from? Is that Mystery Men? <laughs> yes, Mystery okay. Men, yes. <laughs> I gotta say, you thought you got me, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so let's use the Twilight Zone rule, the Buck Halton rule, as they say, uh, okay. for Twilight Zone, right? Where you can't have two things. Like, you can't have time travel and aliens, for example, right? Our friend yes. Tom from the Twilight Zone podcast talks about this a lot. That's Buck Halton was a producer on the Twilight Zone, and one of the rules was we can't, we can only have one fantastical mystical element per story, right? So let's let's apply this to David Dunn. Right, where he is super strong. So he's got two. Yeah, yeah, he's unbreakable. And he can psychic. And then, <laughs> so, and he can psychically sense people. So that's, uh, I think that's one of the things when I first saw. It, I was like, well, that's weird. Why does he have both of those? Right, that, that those seem to have no connection between them. Right. So I don't. What mm-hmm. do you think about him having the two powers that have nothing to do with each other? Like, so the unbreakable and the strength go hand in hand. Well, yeah, no, I agree. Like, it's invulnerability, strength, fine. That's one package. Yeah. I get it. But, like, what, the psychic ability, like, the intuition, because he, he has an intuition when he first meets Samuel Jackson. Like, he has feelings. But then he starts really, Samuel Jackson's like, have you ever tried to focus it? And he's, he, you know, David Dunn starts thinking about it. And, and then he starts, you know, standing in crowds and having people brush by him because these flashes of, like, crimes or secrets. It's some dark stuff. I mean, I, I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I applaud the movie for, like, going there, right? Because it's like, God, people are, people are terrible. Right for the most right. part, they do terrible things. So we see a lot of dark stuff here. The child abuse, which is we can infer is is uh, the character from the next two films, and then some other dark stuff. But what's your take on that? Did that strike you as odd that he had this other ability? It does strike me as odd, and it's one of the things that like okay, this is really weird that he has this because it it doesn't seem like it's related to the others, as you've said. It doesn't. It's not a strength thing, you know, like Superman. He's like an all-encompassing hero, but I give that, I give it to him for that because, you know, he's he's the first. He's really the first major superhero. He can fl- he can fly. He can he has strength. He can blow cold air. He can do laser beams out of his eyes. Right, like Superman can do everything because he's Superman. Well, also right? okay, that that that's your outside of the universe explanation. The in universe explanation is Superman. He's an alien, right? So his, I know. His, his physiology is totally different. So the the yellow sun is what gives him all his power. So like his sight, all his senses are extenuated. He has other abilities and all other like that all tracks inside. Like there's a logical explanation. But for Mister Glass, he's like, hey, I have very breakable bones. I know someone else out there is on the opposite end of the spectrum, and they they have right. unbreakable bones. I'm like, okay, fine. But what what is the psychic part coming? Yeah, this? exactly. <laughs> so what does what does Glass have? See, I get it. Superman's a Mary Sue. <laughs> All right, well, we'll talk about I'm that off microphone. No, but, no. <laughs> um, what, what, so, like, yeah, so if he's got psychic abilities, what does Mr. Glass have that's the opposite? Well, we can get into that in the third film, Brad, and I'm not going to spoil anything oh, for okay. you. But they, they, okay. they, that's fine. They, it's not an A-B, though, but they're, they they do add more to Mr. Glass's supervillainy uh, repertoire in the third film. But which, to to be fair, is not a retcon, I think. I think the, the you can see how 
you can extrapolate that from what happens in this film. But anyway, you'll get there when you get to glass. But all that I want when we get to the third one is more great one liners like Schwarzenegger had in Batman and Robin. But what killed the dinosaur? The Bat- Ice Age. Batman and Robin is the fourth film of the Batman franchise, but just for the record. So <laughs> I know. Did I say three? No, but it's the third film of this franchise. It doesn't. I know. Uh, I know. I know. Batman. I know. That's the fourth one. Chill out, good buddy. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> so, um, this is better than Batman and Robin. Oh, I, I, well, that we are agreed. Uh, we, we have found some common ground in this conversation. But the the thing with the psychic ability, though. That gives him the knowledge to stop a crime, and then his strength mm-hmm. and unbreakable ability gives him the means to stop the crime. All right. So how else? I mean, how else would he find out about this stuff? He, he, he would have to be a cop, like you said, or have a police scanner mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, so it is kind of a shortcut. But then, so many other heroes like Superman. Like even in the film, right? Elijah tells David, he's like, "Well, you know, other heroes have X-ray vision, and these are extrapolations of things. Maybe just a feeling, maybe an intuition." So again. Outside and inside the film itself, like it, it's it's looking at comic books through a real world lens. So mm-hmm. that is that is their explanation for it. I guess I'll go with it. But like even in the you know in Split in the next film, there's a, there's a whole set of rules and stuff about that character, and those 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 makes it like nothing contradicts it. Nothing is. I I just think that's a more um. That that package goes together <laughs> makes more sense than the package of Bruce Willis' powers here. I mean, that's we'll like... get to that next time because yeah, don't spoil anything because I haven't seen it yet. Right, so, yeah. right. So there you go. So that that is one thing I think. Even back when I saw it, I was like, well, "That's that's weird. Why would he have that power?" And, but but mm-hmm. without that power, what is the story? Right? What is where does he go from there if he doesn't have and he, and he doesn't find out about Elijah at the end, right? Because he's like, right. I think this is the part where we shake hands, and that's because he knows. He'll discover all that stuff then, which I don't know why he decided to do that either. <laughs> I guess he was so right. obsessed about proving his point about how you're Superman and I'm Lex Luthor. <laughs> Basically, yeah. he was so obsessed with that uh, that he just had to make it a reality. But, I, you know, th- this guy, he is mentally disturbed, right? Uh, Elijah. I mean, he has – that's the thing about him, right? I, you know, as we were joking about at the beginning, every villain is the hero of their own story, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he does some horrible things here, but he's doing it, you know, to, to prove a point, And – What's sad is every, the, everyone in the real world will think he's crazy, but he's not. He's actually right. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the way he goes about trying to prove that he's right is horrible, and that's mm-hmm. the difference between a hero and a villain. So, Right. You know, I, I like a lot about his character, Mr. Glass, because, you know, like that opening scene when he's born, right, that flashback to right. when he's born, like that's a traumatic thing where that guy's like, were you abused or something like this because this yeah. kid's bones like, are all broken. Did you drop this baby? They're like, no, of course yeah, not. Did you drop this baby? Yeah. And the fact that she gave birth in like a clothing store, you know, like just like it's, it was a really interesting, you know, backstory for his character as well. And I like him as a character. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know, you've read a lot of comics and you didn't see that ending coming, you know, so I don't know if most people didn't see that ending coming. I don't know, but yeah. Well, and then, you know, and I had forgotten cause I hadn't watched this in years, but I'd forgotten they, they do frame it like, or Mr. Glass, right? I mean, like, they, it starts out with his birth, right? We have mm-hmm. a flashback to him as a kid. We're going to have more than one flashback to him as a kid, but they end up editing those out. And, you know, you know that having having those flashbacks about him, like, informs his character. And it's actually, it's almost 30 minutes into the movie before you even meet adult Mr. Glass, right? Mm-hmm. Samuel Jackson. So there's, like, a buildup, because you know you're going to... I mean, obviously, if you've seen the trailer, you know, Sam, you know Samuel Jackson's in the movie, right? But... Mm-hmm. I, I, I like that first scene. It, it tells you a lot about his character too. When he's like, he's gonna, he's going off about how uh, this is this comic book artwork. It's it's artwork. It's true art, right? And he's gonna yeah. sell it to this guy. And he's like, all right, pack it up. Yeah, my son's gonna love this. And he's like, your son. He's like, he's like, hold your son. Four. He's like, okay, leave. We've had a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> this is not for you know some four year old's wall. This is art, and that tells you a lot about his character. And I like that. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think I think Samuel uh, Samuel Jackson was a good choice for this character. Um, you know, if that's who Shyamalan wanted from the beginning, then I mean, he's spot on, right? He wrote this character for him, and I think he did a great job for it. So, well, let, let me ask you uh, about David Dunn's weakness: the water. As it's what's revealed in the film, as a kid, mm-hmm. he almost drowned, right? Mm-hmm. So, do you think? The water is a mental block for him because that is how he almost died as a kid, or is it truly his kryptonite? No, oh, jeez, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just, 
I just interpreted that it's his kryptonite, I guess. I don't know. But I mean, like, he showers, right? So, I don't know. Well, all right.